This podcast of the Tailgate Society is sponsored by Rivelton Distilling Company. When Rob and Christy Taylor started following the Kentucky Bourbon Trail in 2012, they fell in love with not only bourbon, but the entire distilling process. So they opened Revelton Distillery, where they offer a family of products, including vodka, gin, whiskey, and Revelton Shine. Come visit the Tasting Room at 1400 West Clay Street in Osceola, Iowa, or pick some up at your local hy V or Fairway grocery store. This podcast contains material that is intended for mature audiences and may not be suitable for all listeners. Enjoy. Would you like to sample some of my nuts? I don't want to get on the bandwagon. I'll burn that wagon down and join the band. Traveling troubadours terrorizing street corners just to try to get some supper in our hands. Now I waited all my life to get this off my chest screen bloody murder until someone understands that it ain't about the money, the drugs, or the women. I make this noise just because I can. And we'll all join in to that original sin. So let's get rowdy and reckless. Let's get rowdy and reckless. Hello, and welcome back once again to another edition of Old Man Strength, a podcast of the Tailgate Society and brought to you by Revelton Distilling Company in Osceola, Iowa. I am Tim Johnson, joined as always by Mr. Chris Shipley. Chris, how are we doing this evening? Uh, Short of technical difficulties and things like that, we're doing well. Yeah, I mean... Maybe you might need to find like an IT guy. I don't know if you happen to know anyone who might be able to help you. I don't know. I mean, you'd think that this would not be my first time opening up a a laptop, but now I got to navigate both, you know, PC and and Mac worlds. So it's it's a challenge. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. So the new job has you on a Mac. Uh, How do you feel about that? That's I mean. It's it's nice. It, it, it's pretty smooth. It, I mean, there's a lot of muscle memory. Uh, apparently, control V doesn't actually paste anything. <laughs> um, so I don't know how many times I've hit that. Uh, the uh, minimize and maximize buttons are on the wrong side of the browser. It's it's a struggle. So, um, yeah, you keep this up. We're going to have to t- call this thing very old man strength because <laughs> you're beginning to sound a little bit like my dad. Um <laughs> well well good well good um you know last time we we talked we had mentioned that we both started some new jobs and, and now that we're actually you know in you know an actual whole week in on doing these things you, you're still feeling pretty excited i am yep uh it's a good fit uh met a great group of uh people today that came in for a conference and uh i think we're we're i'm ready to roll I mean, at this point, I'm ready to get into some systems and break some stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I suppose uh, that's one good service that you might be able to provide is showing people where some weaknesses are. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Or mine. mine. (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah, that might be the weaknesses you show, but still. I mean, Um, at some point, you you stop asking quite you stop asking questions, you stop asking for permission and you just ask for forgiveness. (laughs) <laughs> so that's kind of what i'm that's kind of where i know i've 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 hit my you know my my level of workness that i can uh i can start asking for forgiveness because i feel comfortable enough to try something so well i've i've met stacy so i can only imagine that you're an expert at asking for forgiveness oh my gosh we're <laughs> minutes in <laughs> let's try to be on our best behavior for our guests Oh, that's true. Okay, well, speaking of our guest, Chris, I will go ahead and let you introduce our guest. Yeah, well, you know, we've talked about wanting to bring on, we we have a lot of Cyclone content here, uh, but we've both said that this isn't just a Cyclone podcast. It's a podcast for for guys and for women to to talk about life and, and, and things like that. And we've always wanted to bring on, you know, people from, from different genres and different schools and different fandoms. So, uh, reached out to um, John Miller, who is uh, the publisher of HawkeyeNation.com, 
uh, formerly used to be a, a radio uh, personality here in Des Moines. Uh, so, John, thanks for hopping on Old Man Strength with us. I appreciate you guys coming. I mean, I'm I'm just here for the hat. I was told I'd need a hat. <laughs> right. So you guys know I'm a I'm a I will do anything for a trucker hat. I'm I'm wearing an Iowa Golf Association free hat now. So, but no, I, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, I, I'm familiar, um, with what you guys, then I, I haven't listened to the podcast a ton, but I'm familiar with it. Um, and I, I was talking with Tim earlier and I, and I actually have listened to a few now, the memory served and, and, and Chris, I'm, I'm familiar with you and your story and, and you're sharing, um, Cass, I would almost call it a testimony, uh, through the years relative to your, uh, life experiences, uh, your spirit of grace that you um, have navigated this life with. So, uh, yeah, so I know a little bit about you guys. Well, thank you very much, John. Yeah, I know uh, when that whole thing uh, kind of blew up about about Marty, you were one of the first ones to reach out to me in a private message, uh, and we didn't know each other at the time. And and I always thought highly of that and appreciated it. So, well, you're you're welcome, and um, you've you've been. Um, you know, you've, I think provided just a great, I don't even like using the term witness because of the connotations that come with it and not everyone's into that sort of thing. But I think you've, you, you've handled it with a plum. You've been very transparent and vulnerable relative to your journey and those things aren't easy. So I think you've probably inspired a lot of people with just your grace. So that's a, that's a really nice legacy. Uh, if, if that's the best legacy I could come up with, I'll take it. So we're all going to leave one one way or another. <laughs> That's so, right. Let, let's hope it's good. The, the old man always said, you know, you never saw a U-Haul behind a hearse. So, <laughs> true. Uh, true. If the only thing I can leave is some good memories and some, and some grace. I'll take it. That's it. That's it. No doubt. Next time I move, I'm renting a hearse and a U-Haul. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, just to prove your dad wrong. Um, well, that wouldn't be the first time that happened either. Oh, that's well. I, hey, honestly, a hearse would actually be a pretty decent moving vehicle. It, you can fit a fair amount of things back there, and you know that they can carry some weight. So, maybe not a bad way to go. Hmm. For sure, uh, John. Let's kind of start with um, where you began. I, I know that uh, I, I listened to some of your story on Chris Williams' podcast. Uh, mm -hmm which was one of my favorite episodes. And I think that gave me an insight into a little bit about you that I didn't know, but you weren't always into uh, the, the radio aspect and, and things like that, where you kind of started off on websites and, and just, uh, just a crazy idea of, uh, of an email chain, right? Yeah. You know, it really kind of where it began was when I was 13 living in West branch, Iowa at the time. And, um, I told my dad straight faced once I realized that I was not going to be in the NBA, I said, <laughs> I'm going to be the voice of the Hawkeyes when I grow up and I'm going to have a national television show. And he's like, okay, that's great. Um, you know, and then he and my grandma Miller and I'm, I'm not casting shade on either of them. They're both correct relative to percentages. They were both like, you know, everybody wants to do those things, but very few people do. You're going to need to have a backup plan. And I, I, uh, I've always, you know, I should have realized then that I was going to be an entrepreneur because I'm like, there is no backup plan. This is what I'm going to do. And, and then um, I went to college to be a sportscaster and then kind of got out of it when I realized I probably had to, you know, the, the hours of a local sportscaster just didn't line up to me with what I thought a, a family life would be. Um, and that's just my opinion. And um, so I got out of it and then the internet came along in, you know, I started to participate on fan forums in like 96, 97, the big 10, the official big 10 had big 10.org and they had fan forums. And that was as wild of a wild west as oh, there yeah. has ever been. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was just brutal. And, um, and I was, had moved out to Denver at the time for a brief spell. And my name was Denver Hawk when I finally registered, it was a couple of years after I first found them, but it just blew my mind. I'm like, this is the best. And then, um, I just decided, you know what, this internet thing might be my way to get back into chasing some of the dreams that I had. And I started an email, um, sent it to family and friends. And what I would do is at the time I was copying and pasting 
online articles from like the Gazette and some other places. And um, I would send those articles to family and friends, but I put like a couple paragraphs of commentary at the top and I called the email list Miller time. And then their, their friend, they would forward it to their friends. They would forward it to their friends, ask me to come on the distro, blah, blah, blah. And in a matter of like six months or so, the distro was up to 5,000. And I was wholesaling propane for a company at that time. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And I was using their servers, you know, and that was, <laughs> and that was back in the day before IT was really like looking for things like that. So right. nobody came and busted me on it. But somebody reached out to me from the Gazette and said, hey, you can't copy and paste things. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So I stopped copying and pasting. Then I started linking to things, which I've been very militant on to, that, to, the, to this day, um, you know, attribution and things like that. Um, and then a, a company, uh, a new company started up, a new tech company started up and they said, hey, you know, we're going to build a bunch of team sites and we've built this thing called a recruiting database. Um, we're called rivals.com and we would like for you to come and do what you're doing for us. And we'll pay you a thousand dollars a month. And I'm like, man, right. Chiss. <laughs> and, uh, and that was great. So I started to probably spend 30 to 40 hours a week on that. In addition to, you know, 30, 40 hour a week office job at, at energy, but I loved it. I was 27, 28 at the time had, had energy to burn and that's when my dreams really kicked back in. And I thought I saw the internet and I'm like, this is actually going to be the future. And, um, you know, funny thing, a, a couple of years, I, I started freelancing then for different people, voice of the Hawkeyes, um, rivals.com goes up in flames in 2000 with the uh, dot com crash in October of 2000. I registered HawkeyeNation.com in November of 2000 just because just I listened to Jim Rome at that time. I think Jim maybe just was nationally syndicated at that juncture, but he still had a number of Southern California listeners that only called a show. And Jim was a big Raider Nation, Raider Nation. I'm like, Hawkeye Nation kind of sounds cool. Plus with a little bit of the double entendre to the Native American heritage of the state. So that's why I bought it, not realizing that um, five months later on April 14th of 01, I would actually launch HawkeyeNation.com as an independent site when rivals went belly up. And, um, and then shortly thereafter, I started freelancing with a paper uh, periodical at that time called Voice of the Hawkeyes. And Voice of the Hawkeyes was owned by the same company that owned the Weather Channel. And they also owned a number of these periodicals around the country, uh, the Notre Dame. I mean, these are, these were big things back then. And I told them, I'm like, Hey, we need to bundle a paper subscription with an online subscription because online is where this thing is going. Now, folks, this is, this is 2001. And I was told by this multi-billion dollar company, you've got it backwards. Paper's always been big. It's always going to be big. And this internet thing is a fad. <laughs> <laughs> Six months later, I quit. I left. I started another site. And that's what I, I just, that's what I did. And um, I, I started just, pull, you know, I went and printed off uh, several hundred flyers a week. On one side had the Iowa football roster for that game. On the other side, it said, come visit my website, HawkeyeNation.com. And I put those hundreds of flyers in a cooler, a beer cooler that had wheels on it. That was actually a new invention at the time, too. <laughs> and um, I would pull that around Kinnick Stadium parking lots, handing them out one by one, shaking <laughs> hands of people, introducing myself, um, come visit my website. And this all like it doesn't sound all that interesting probably right now, but we you, what people may not, you know, the younger listeners may not realize is there were no internet websites. Um, when I started and I, I wasn't the father of them, but I was in on the early going, the term blog was invented six months after I became a blogger. Um, so I guess I'm a little OG in that regard, but you had to do that. And, and I asked for press credentials early on and the Iowa sports media staff wouldn't have pissed on me if I was on fire. Um, <laughs> And it's, I've used, I've used that line about that exact story hundreds of times because it's true. Iowa State's SID, uh, Tom Crochelle and those guys, Tom's recently retired. I sent him a note a few months ago. Uh, they were awesome. 
Um, they deserve far better treatment from me than I gave them. Uh, same for Jamie Pollard. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was the early days. And, um, you know, I was one of the first. And then, you know, Tom Cakert reached out to me a few months after I started doing, uh, you know, back with the rivals. And Tom was, you know, writing a monthly article for a periodical in the Quad City Times or not in the Quad City Times, but in the Quad Cities. And then Tom and I got to meet. Tom was the director of Big Brothers, Big Sisters back then. Tom's a great human. And so but this that was 99. I mean, we were, this is like, we're old, man. We are old. It was one day you wake up and you're the old guy. Back okay. then, I was the young guy blazing trails. And uh, man, it seems like it, it, it was literally a different life ago. I, I, re, I can relate to the one day you wake up and you're an old guy. I walked into this new job and, and everybody's young. And, and, and I think to myself, you know, I, I'm, I, I realize I'm 51, but I'm still like, I'm, I, I am jokingly the problems I had this today, but I'm tech savvy. I, I, I know most of the technical jargon that those kids know. Um, but man, there's some conversations that fly around. And I'm just sitting over there in my corner going, I got nothing. I got nothing to contribute. So right, right. I'm with you. <laughs> did, did you <laughs> early in your career, did you ever work with Jim Zobel? I did. Jim and I, um, I started working with Jim in the fall of 2005. Um, so in 2003, I had been asked to do a, a post-game show on WMT, uh, AM 600 in Eastern Iowa called the Golden Harvest Hawkeye Huddle. I did that, did that from my then home in Shawnee, Kansas with a, a radio board, did that for two years. Also in 03 and 04, uh, I was driving up from Kansas City to Des Moines every, I think it was Thursday night. Um, to just do a one hour radio show, the Polk County iClub radio show, uh, Joe Schmelka and the late Tim Dara had me on. And I just felt like I need to do these things and show people I'm willing to bust my ass. Um, that's just the only way I ever knew to get ahead. And I, I would just drive up and back in the same night. And then I somehow parlayed that into co-hosting sound off with Jim Zawal starting in 2005, something I did with Jim, well, actually 2004, something I did with Jim for eight years until 2012, which is the last year he did it. And he would pass away um, uh, in the spring of 2013. And I did over a hundred sound offs with him. Um, probably, th you know, what is that? Probably 300, 400 broadcast hours with Jim Zawal. And this is a guy that I grew up emulating. Uh, in my closet um, with a, you know, four inch black and white TV that someone had given my family that had an antenna and I would turn the volume down and I would do play by play in the closet. And I pretended that I was Jim Zobel. And I told Jim that, and he, I mean, he was at that stage of life where he, he was playing the role of Jim Zobel. You know, he was playing the role he was created for. He was, he was the, the elder statesman and he got such a kick hearing me tell him that I wanted to be him when I grew up and, um, it was a, it was a blessing. Um, you know, I was the third ever sports director at WHO radio. The two before me were Jim Zobel and Ronald Reagan. Um, it doesn't make me special. It just makes me lucky. And, uh, yeah, my time with Jim was 98% awesome, 2% frustrating because, uh, much like Jim, I like to control the mic when it's in front of me. <laughs> and Jim was in his seventies and a actually eighties at the time. And I'd be going on a soliloquy right when the game Mike would come to us after the Iowa post game show that Jim would say, get them off the air. These guys are no good. They're waiting for the stars. Get them off the air. <laughs> and, um, I would start just trying to set up the scene, you know, uh, and, and set up the, the, just an opening monologue. And I'd be two minutes into it, building to a crescendo and Jim would just come in. Well, you know, John, this is what I think. And I would just sit there and I'd grip my teeth and I'd go home and my, and my wife was like, John, you are doing this with someone that you grew up idolizing. One day you're going to be that old man. If you're fortunate, just appreciate it and don't let it bug you. And I didn't after that. I, I appreciated every minute with Jim. That, that, that's a great, that's a great way to look at it. I, I grew up listening to Iowa. I was probably more of an Iowa fan growing up just because of lack of options, I guess I would say. I mean, the Cyclones were not on much. It's the old, it's the old <laughs> Iowa State fan standby. Well, yeah. of course, everybody's an Iowa fan. It was the only thing on the radio. That's right. But I, 
I I can still remember Jim Zobel's call of Marv Cook catching that last second touchdown against Ohio State mm-hmm. and hearing it on the radio. It, it's still a vivid memory for me. Yeah, my, my entire family, we were listening to the radio at the time because we were in West Branch. We were in a basement in West Branch, Iowa, which Marv Cook is four years. He graduated high school in 84. I graduated in 89. So Marv's five years older than me. I grew up in West Branch idolizing Marv Cook. Um, and yeah, that was, uh, that was a heck of a day and just crazy to think those games weren't all on television. Um, I, I don't think I ever saw uh, the full game until like 15 years later when bootlegs started showing up on YouTube or something like that. And YouTube was only three years old at the time, whenever that stuff started happening. So, yeah, for sure. Sorry. I, I've been having some, some internet connection issues. So if I've, if I'm cutting out here in a bit, I'm going to see what I can do. Sure. So you, you guys just keep rolling. Yeah. So I, I guess what I'll ask you next is, um, and, and we'll talk sports, we'll talk family, we'll, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. Anything. But what would you say you're most proud of personally? I know you, you have a lot of pride in what you've done Hawkeye wise, but what are you most proud of personally? And you can't choose your family. That's, that's too easy. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's like it's like people asking what's your favorite moment ever and i'm like well i have to say my marriage right my kids being born but really it's tata holloway standing on the field <laughs> in the <Capitol laughs> let's not let's not bs anybody here um i would say this and you know it's it's funny because i'm at that point in time i mean i i, I still do a little hawkeye podcast every now and then but when i when i retire and, and Chris, you and I are the exact same age and, and I hope to be done in five years with what I'm doing now with the energy company. And then I'm going to actually podcast for real. And it's probably not going to be anything about sports. It's, I think I've been building up my whole life or what's going to be coming. But I think the thing I'm most proud of is I've burned boats, but not bridges. Um, I've been very careful to try my best to not be too much of an a-hole in my life to where I've made people despise me and close potential doors to opportunities that I may one day need to open. Um, and the, when I left the energy industry in the early 2000s to, to chase after these sports dreams, I, I left with um, respect and I respected the people I worked with. I didn't I didn't say how you like me now. I'm out of here. I don't need you. I didn't, I've never done that. Um, that even with the people, mo- especially with people that I didn't care for people that were grump, that were gruff, that were grumpy. Um, I would always walk by their offices every morning and I would smile and say, Hey, good morning, Larry. How are you? I'm not going to say the guy's last name, but his first name is Larry. Um, Hey, Hey Larry, how's it going? It took me a year to crack through his facade. Larry became one of my best friends at that company. And it's just like, don't burn. I've not burned bridges. So I've been able to walk back across some of them when I came back to the energy industry in 2013. And, and I'll, you know what, I'll tell you guys some things that I've never shared publicly. Um, seems like as good a time as any, um, when, so I had a consulting business there in like 2010, 2009, where I had learned how to generate revenue from an independent online website using um, national banner ads and learning how to reach out to these national banner ad networks, understanding cost per thousand, revenue per page. And I, you know, I was making six figures just from my own efforts from advertising, national remnant advertising. And I'm like, you know what? I can help other John Millers out there do this too. I actually reached out to Jeremy Lind um, and he and I were talking and Jeremy was the former owner of Cyclone Fanatic. Um, he was the founder of it. Um, I'd reached out to him and he and I were having discussions about me purchasing Cyclone Fanatic. And um, I realized that that probably would have been a bad business decision because the Cyclone fans would have rightfully said no. <laughs> we're not, we're not going to support that. Um, and then I put, I put, um, Jason Luch um, in touch with Jeremy, uh, Jason, very successful businessman, great, great guy, a uh, great Iowa stater, just great Iowan. Um, and, um, and then I had 
mentioned to Jason, you need to hire Chris Williams. Chris was down, I think, in Shenandoah doing radio at that time. And Chris and I have a long time relationship. And anyway, so then I, I, I kind of showed those guys what I was doing. I had multiple, multiple websites around the country that were clients of mine. It was kind of the agency model. I take 15%, they get the rest. And that was going really good until the economic crash seeped in of, of 08, 09, seeped into the advertising community. And what was once generating three, four, five X started to generate one X. And um, things didn't, things were going badly. Things turned south and I was arrogant, prideful. And I hid things. I hid those things from my wife because I always felt I could turn over enough rocks and spin enough plates to where I could pull myself out of it. Um, difference between me and Marty Terrell is I wasn't willing to break the law to do those things, but there's some similarities. And, um, I just hit it from my wife. I, I call it a financial infidelity. I put $50,000 on credit cards, again, believing, ha having an unhealthy self-belief in my ability to do anything. And, uh, I couldn't pull out of this one. And in the spring of 2013, um, those plates started to crash and I had a number of friends in my life and, and mentors that said, John, you've got to, you've got to be honest with your wife. And, and um, we nearly were divorced. Um, it was the hardest three months of my life. I probably got down to 180 pounds and I was about 220 before then. I couldn't sleep. Anxiety was destroying me because I was withholding things from her. It was eating me alive. And um, so I came clean to her in March of 2013 she was seriously contemplating leaving me. And uh, on Easter Sunday of 2013, she forgave me. It was the single greatest feeling of my entire life, um, being forgiven by someone else that you had harmed and broken their trust. And I felt at that time there wasn't anything I could do. Even though the reality was I was over $200,000 in debt, um, some of it uh, to the IRS, um, a significant amount of it to the IRS, um, and then credit card debt. I, I felt like, you know what? My wife believes in me. She's still with me. I'm going to figure this out. So I called up some friends that were still in propane that had stayed in propane from the early two thousands and had now risen to positions of prominence in that industry. Um, and I always knew when I left the energy industry for whatever it was that you call what I did, that I was leaving behind a much more lucrative financial um, future, but I had to chase my dreams. And um, I called them up and I got a job back wholesaling propane, which is making, I was making the same amount of money in 2013 when I got back into it than what I was making when I left it in 2003. I was thoroughly humbled. Uh, we considered bankruptcy. And I said to my wife, I'm like, I can't do that. What will people think of me here? And she's like, John, you got to stop worrying about what people think of you and think about your family first. And um, so I was absolutely humbled. I was humbled so much that I'm, I don't care about sharing this story now and I don't care what anybody thinks of me. Um, but we didn't file bankruptcy. And for those people that do, that's, I mean, sometimes that's your way out. Um, I'm not passing any judgment there. Um and I was able to negotiate with the IRS to pay every cent of tax that I ever owed because that was important to me. My accountant at the time said we could file an offer and compromise. You'd probably be able to pay one third of what you owe in taxes. I said, what is the amount that I am obligated to pay to meet every cent of tax debt I've incurred? He told me what it was. And I sold uh, pieces of my Hawkeye Nation and company at that time to raise that money. And I paid 100% of every cent of tax that I ever owed. And the reason why I did that is because there's two reasons. One, that just felt like the right thing to do because you guys pay taxes. You've paid every cent of tax you've ever had. And two, one day I knew I wanted to share the story. And I wanted to share the story honestly. And um, I wanted to be able to say, I, I've always done, I've always paid my debts. I've always done what was right and what was uh, lawful. And I did. And so we go to Oklahoma with a couple hundred grand in debt and I didn't care. I was happy. 
I'm like, man, I can't wait to get up every day. I can't wait to go to this propane job that I left in 03 because I hated every second of it because I didn't want to work for anybody else. And I looked at what I did, and I am going to answer your question. I looked at what I did in sports and blogging and all this. And I started to think for a second, man, what a waste of time that was. But then I got back into propane and people were still trying to sell and market propane the same way that they had been in 2003 when I left. And I created a blog in one month after I started in propane. I created a propane blog, all right? And I'm like, I'm going to create a brand. I'm going to build a brand. This is what I know how to do. And I started blogging and I started just sending out to prospects so that when I finally called them, it wouldn't be a cold call. It'd be a warm call. I also understand the, the subconscious aspect of celebrity. If people read you enough, they think they know you. And if they think they know you, they think they'll trust you. And after four years, I became the third best selling salesperson in the company. And at that time, it was the third largest propane wholesale company in the country, a multi-billion dollar company. And I felt like I could do it on my own. I approached my wife who just four years ago had forgiven me for a financial infidelity. And I said, honey, um, we're making a quarter million dollars a year right now. This is as easy as it gets, but I want to start my own business. Not because I want to, it wasn't about the money. It's I'm an entrepreneur. I want to build my own thing. I don't want to, I don't want to have to ask somebody for two days off for a long weekend in the winter when they don't let you do that in the industry. And she said, okay. I said, we're probably not going to make anything for a year. She said, okay. Because we paid off all of our debt that we had incurred in four years. We paid off every cent of debt. I paid every tax. I paid every credit card company back. I didn't file bankruptcy. None of it. Paid it all back. And saved up enough to where I could go a year without an income. And I wrote a 15-page white paper, convinced two other people to partner with me. And we launched that company in um, officially in, um, gosh, it would have been December 23rd of 2018. And um, we are uh, building our own organic proprietary propane terminal right now outside of East St. Louis. We're doing it all with our own money. We've taken on no debt. We've bootstrapped it every step of the way. Um, it's been more successful than even I could have imagined in my wildest imagination. And all that, most of that is because I never burned a bridge. Um, I burned the boats. And by burning the boats, I mean, I left the best job that I ever had that I could have worked another 15 years and probably retired making six figures a year after taxes, which is a great living. I just had more mountains to climb. I think I needed to prove to myself that that blip version of John Miller that was so cocky and arrogant and full of himself that he made stupid mistakes that thankfully was able to work his way out of. That wasn't the real me. This is. And um, I'm proud of it. I'm not proud of it in a way that I am proud, like, oh, look at my bank account or look at this, look at that. I'm proud of it because it didn't exist. I'm proud of it because me and my partner shopped it around to some private equity companies and they all told us that this industry doesn't need another propane wholesale company. And I, and I you know, we just believe that we are going to do things differently and we have, and, and we will continue to do that. So there's a feeling that an entrepreneur has when you build something of nothing, especially when everyone says you can't do it. And the same guy that told us that we, that, that, that the industry didn't need another propane company. Um, two years ago, we just wanted some spare capital around. We didn't mind paying seven, 8% interest just to have it around for a rainy day. He, he gave us a million dollars and, uh, and uh, we paid him that back last week. And he sent us a note that said, um, if you guys ever need anything, if you ever need to do this again, I'll be happy to give it to you. You guys have, um, done a great job. He's proud of us. And, um, so yeah, so I'm proud. I'm not prideful. If that makes sense. I'm just proud of it. it, makes sense. it, it it's an entrepreneur's pride. And those of you listening to this that are an entrepreneur, you get it. Those of you that are not, I just don't know how I can explain it any more than that. Sorry if I went way off the road there. So no, that's I, that's kind of what what this whole podcast is for is 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 to talk about things like that. And I'll touch on a couple things that I I think are important. You said something about pride and, and, and proud. There's a huge difference there. I remember my dad used to tell me uh, pride is probably one of the one things that can get you into a lot of trouble um, because pride 
it makes you kind of selfish sometimes. And I remember at his funeral, uh, when I gave his eulogy, I told him and told the crowd uh, that pride is is exactly what he said it was, but that I hoped that he was proud of the man that I had become. So it, there's a huge difference there. Um, as far as telling that story goes, I I can understand why you, why you do want to tell that story, because when people are vulnerable and have overcome some challenges that sometimes are not of your own, but are sometimes mistakes that you make, mm -hmm. um, those are the most powerful lessons. And you went through a lot of things that I think people need to hear, not necessarily the nuts and bolts of it, but the the overall theme of of having some integrity and 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 digging your way out of it and not giving up i th i think that's that's powerful uh it's not an easy story for me to tell everybody about what happened to dad and marty uh there were even some people in my own family that didn't want me to talk about it because they thought that it was embarrassing towards my dad and to me it was a way to tell everybody about my dad the good parts of him, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, he was human and he made a mistake by trusting somebody, but there he wasn't the only one that did that. Um, and he did a lot of good things in those periods too. And it was my chance to to, mm -hmm. to tell those things. And it's the same thing when I talk about uh, when I was sick and had cancer and so on. I don't say that. I don't tell that story because I want people to come and pat me on the back. I honestly tell that story because a I promised God that I would tell people that story because he did he did a lot for me mm -hmm. and b because I never know there might be somebody else out there that might be feeling kind of kind of in the same boat or feeling helpless. That's it. That that's exactly it. Um, the stories that you've shared relative to your health, relative to your father, the story that I just shared relative to pride, arrogance, ego. Um, um, withholding things, being secretive in America. These are all things that are common to man. And when I was at my lowest points in the spring, uh, in the first quarter of 2023, I called anyone and everyone that I could. And I said, tell me about the tough old days. I called my dad, dad, tell me, remind me of when I was little and you guys were living in a trailer in Guthrie center and remind me that you didn't have money to buy food. Sometimes the things that remind me of these things, I called everyone looking for anecdotes like that. And then I asked them, how did you make it through? And I drew so much strength from those stories and those anecdotes of hearing the struggle that people went through the fire they endured that forged them into what they became and what I saw. All we see is what we let people see. We don't get a chance to, to measure the temperature of the fire that forged them into the people that we see before us, the success stories that we see, of the things that we may idolize or look up to in those people. We don't usually get a chance to know those things. We only see the end result. The end result is insignificant compared to the journey that brought us to our current state of end results since I'm hardly an end result. We need to share these stories. And listen, I could lose everything tomorrow and I'll figure something else out to do because at this point in time, I, I, I'm content. I'm, I'm content. Um, but yeah, you, you need to share these stories because there are people that do need to hear them. Whatever ver your story, my story, Tim's story, everybody's got a story. We just need to slow down and listen because someone needs to hear it. I do. You know, I, I'm really glad that, that you talk about that because one of the questions that I had as you were telling your story, um, you kept on referencing uh, people that you would talk to people mm -hmm. that would pull you aside and, and maybe give you a difficult conversation or people that would help you understand. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, and earlier you talked about people who were mentors to you and, and, and helped kind of right. help you find your voice. Right. 
I, one of the things Chris and I want to be able to, to talk about it as this podcast is, as we joke all the time, we're old and we know everything, but the idea that now you also get to play a role as a mentor or as someone who helps someone else find their way. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you feel you're doing, because it's very clear to me that you feel like you have an obligation as much as it is to, to, you know, be a man of integrity and, and don't worry about what, what other people think as so much as whether or not you can look at yourself in the mirror. Right. Um, But that you also have, I, you know, I know that you're a dad. I know that you have all these other people that are involved in your life. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about uh, how you view the lens of, of being now and a quote unquote elder statesman in a lot of ways and, and what you, uh, how, how you manage that. I, I, I enjoy the place in life where I truly do not care what anybody thinks about me. And I really enjoy the um, still having a platform that people still, I think, sometimes care or want to see what I say. That may, I could go away tomorrow too. And maybe I'm misreading that because I certainly have misjudged the power of my own brand at various stops along the way. Sure. Um, but I enjoy telling my daughters every aspect of weakness and failure, not failure. We don't use that term. We, we fail when we quit, but I I've told my daughters, everything I've mm-hmm. told my, I've told my daughters about um, periods of life where I just was, um, I was not, I was certainly not the kind of guy any of them would have tolerated to date. Let's just leave it at that. Um, and, and they're aware of the story that I just shared with you relative to the financial infidelity and the ego and all that. Um, and because they also experienced some pain from it too. Um, but I really, I really enjoy when people reach out, um, like you did Chris or, you know, Chris Williams and I, we, we converse quite a bit and we, we can go a month sometimes without text exchanging, but then we'll exchange texts every day for a week. And it's typically has nothing to do with sports and it just has everything to do with life and positioning and, and, you know, me talking to him saying, dude, you're burning it, man. You're burning it at both ends. You know, uh, can you keep this pace up? And, and cause Chris is phenomenal. Chris is, uh, Chris is a way better person, um, way better on the radio than I ever was. Um, who doesn't love Chris Williams, except for the most, you know, myopic Iowa fan, but um, <laughs> that's their problem. I mean, Chris, Chris is just a phenomenal, phenomenal person and he's the real deal. There's, there's no, there's no fake to him where there was to me on the air. So I, I enjoy that now when I get an opportunity to talk to people and people seek me out. And you know what, another thing that I enjoy doing, and I'm not going to say any names here, but and I, is when I see young people in the media and in other places on Twitter and I see them hustling, I see them grinding is I like to reach out to them and I don't tell anybody about it. And I'm not going to say any names just to encourage them. It's like, dude, I know how you feel. I know that these people loathe you. I know they don't like your modus operandi because you're not quote unquote traditional. You may wave your fan flag a little bit too much for some liking of some of these people. They're going to sneer at you. They're going to um, say things behind your back when you're not there because they did for me too. But people can't shoot you down or try to shoot you down. There's one prerequisite for someone trying to shoot you down. And that is you're already flying. So keep flying because you were made to fly. Fear not the sky. I say that because I wrote that poem to my daughter and I used it a lot. Fear not the sky. You were made to fly. Who gives a bleep what any of these people say? Um, Some of these, some people are institutionalized. They know no different and that's okay. It's what they came up with and that's fine. Not everyone's an entrepreneur. Not everyone's a grinder relative to stepping out and doing their own thing doesn't mean that they're not grinders and they don't work hard at what they do. 
but they're taking shots at you because you make them insecure. Keep making them insecure, not intentionally, but you do it by continuing to be you and do not back off. And it's, it's neat to see the reaction that some people get because I don't think I'm anything. I'm no big deal. Um, I'm just a 51 year old that just wants to golf the rest of my days and, and do so in anonymity and be able to pick my nose at a stoplight in Kansas city. Cause nobody recognizes me anymore, especially with my hair <laughs> falling out. And that's what I kind of like. And it's like, but it's interesting that some people still get a, um, they really appreciate it as if I have more pull than I do or celebrity or whatever. And so I recognize it. I don't, I don't get any pride from that anymore. And I used to get the wrong pride from it, but I know that there's some, there, there's some value in it for other people. So I kind of like using that now for other people. And um, because there's, I mean, there's so many people like Mark Morehouse. Um, he, he really, he always treated me with respect and, and I didn't deserve it. And there's just a number of, uh, you know, Mike Loss, um, a number of, you know, Rob Howe was a traditional media guy and we always got along. So a number of guys like that, you know, kind of helped show me the ropes too when I was younger. And um, it's just kind of what you should do. It's the way it should be. You, um, you've you mentioned your daughters a few times and Tim is a, a father of a young daughter and I have uh, a daughter as well. And mm-hmm. I, I'll speak for myself and then maybe you can elaborate or, or, or go from there. But I think probably one of my main jobs as her dad is to give a good example of what a man should be and how a man treats his family and, and, and his relationships. Um, Sometimes to the detriment, I think that I sometimes put too much pressure on her um, because she will sometimes feel like she has to be perfect for me. Um, and that's very hard. I have to tell her several times, you, you just need to be you, you know, you don't have to worry about disappointing me. You're, you're not going to disappoint me. Um, but I feel like that's a huge task for me to make sure that I teach her and I show her by example, what a good man is by keeping his word, by honoring her mother, by taking care of responsibilities, things like that. Yeah. um, It's the craziest thing that we become parents. You, you buy a, you buy a new television and um, there's a owner's manual that's 150 pages thick you bring a child into this world, they just make sure you know how to put the car seat in the car and they send you home. (laughs) (laughs) And it's, it's, it's just a heavy, heavy responsibility. And, you know, you talk about that thing with your daughter and, and yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that is really hard. You almost have to have a, um, a velvet hammer because there's I share the same thing in that um, sometimes my daughter, I see that she, when she feels like she's disappointed me, it's like really heavy. And I try to say, listen, you're not, the only way you're going to disappoint me is if you don't try your best. And I also remind her that some days the version of our best is different than the version of our best from the previous day. Mm-hmm. because we are all dealing with things. Um, some days are easier than others. So really that's what I've tried to say more than anything. The most consistent thing is just give it your best shot so that you can look back. And if it, you don't hit the height you wanted to hit, or you don't reach the goal you set for yourself, you'll be able to say, well, I did everything I could. It just wasn't good enough this time, but there'll be another time. And, um, But, you know, as far as what a man should be, I think that um, I think that I feel really another thing I'm very proud of because you said I couldn't say it, but is is the father that I've been. I haven't been perfect. I was an alcoholic for the first three years of her marriage, but she never remembers me drinking. Um, And she'll my kids will never, ever have a memory of their dad drinking. And um, 
but that also I got sober, but I still had a lot of problems, um, you know, and our marriage wasn't good at the time. And, and she felt like she needed to be, um, perfect so that we didn't fight about that. So there's just a lot of things. So I, I wish I could do certain things over, but you can't, you can only do the best with what you are now. But I think that the relationship I have with uh, both my daughters is um, I don't know that it could be any better. And I feel really good about that. Amen. Let's uh, let's dive into the, 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 the bad part of this podcast, I suppose. And we'll take some Hawkeye questions. <laughs> i told i told you guys i mean that's like i'm phasing out of the of the whole uh talking sports stuff uh, eventually but we'll still go well so i there was a there's a video floating around out there of brody breck mm-hmm. and i think a, a few people are, are wanting to know your thoughts on whether or not he actually plays football after seeing him throw a baseball this spring no, I mean, I, I've been consistently tweeting for months that if I was um, in their, in the Brecht inner, inner circle um, and was trusted to give an unbiased opinion, I would say, do not play football at all. Do not do it. Why, that, this kid very likely has a 10-figure signing opportunity possibility but maybe three to four mil um in a couple of years what he has is so rare he could go be a a solid um football player and at some schools he could probably be a really good receiver i don't know why receivers even go to iowa frankly i've been saying that for many years too unless you like running wind sprints and blocking (laughs) <laughs> um, no, I, I would say I would I would strongly advise him if the family asked me, don't play football. Focus on baseball. Yeah, I know that the guy from the you know Jeff Smarja did it. That's great. But what's the point? You can be a multimillionaire at baseball almost guaranteed unless you blow your arm out. And if you blow your shoulder out in a couple of years, okay, then go play football. You're still an athlete. So no, I, I I mean, but you know what, ultimately I want him to do what he wants to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And I I am big on trying to not have any regrets or any, I wish I would have. And right now, maybe he feels like he would have a regret if he didn't try playing football, but I wonder if he would get hurt in football, if he would always be haunted by the regret, I should have just focused on baseball. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like focusing on baseball, getting the bag, and then being a 35 year old man who's got himself set up for life, saying, "Man, I sure wish I would have gave football a try." All right, <laughs> right, let's go. I, you know, I, I don't have to work another day of my life. Versus the guy that blew his shoulder out, started for Iowa football as a receiver, um, maybe made practice squad for a couple of months in the NFL. And um, is selling insurance in the state of Iowa, which is not a bad gig at all. But it's not what I think awaits him in baseball. I, I think, I think, especially everything that we know, all the other cautionary tales, certainly what we know about CTE and other risks, I think um, <laughs> I have a hard time ever recommending that someone would, would, football over baseball and i i you know i watch i haven't watched i can't remember the last time i watched any college baseball for sure um but like you said when when you have that in front of you i i i I always think back to to bo jackson you're wearing a kansas city royals uh shirt here um and he did both but man how much better would he have been he he had so many things going for him in baseball that i feel like he didn't even scratch the surface because no, because he didn't focus on it. He didn't focus on it. And then football injuries just destroyed his body to be able to be a prime athlete, even in baseball. Yeah. And, and, and I think, um, I, I think, you know, there is someone that, like you said, like, you know, maybe, you know, when he's 35 years old and, and he's thinking, Oh gee, what if, well, I'd rather 
think what if with a lot of success of what I've already had. Yeah, for sure. Got to secure the bag. And um, yeah, I think of what we were robbed of as fans of Bo Bo Jackson's the greatest athlete of my lifetime. Um, What we were robbed of of him potentially as a baseball player. And uh, but yeah, he was a freak. And and but you know what? Again, Bo wanted to do that, Mm -hmm. but Bo also secured the bag. Bo had the bag from Nike. Um, He had you know the Bo nose. I mean, he had the Brody Brecht can throw a hundred mile an hour and he's what struck out six guys in two innings. And, um, he's, he's a pro pitcher. He's going to get paid like a pro pitcher. Even if he never makes the majors as if he keeps on this trajectory, I would not mess around with football. I always got enough guys that can run wind sprints and block. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sensing a, a, I'm sensing a little bit of bitterness there. Uh, it's not bitterness. It's just, and this this is so bougie, man. I admit up front, they were ten and four last year. It was so freaking boring, it was so boring. Their defense is wonderful, and Kirk, is, Kirk, offensive football to Kirk is do no harm, mm-hmm. do no harm. Yeah, and you know what? The guy's a Hall of Famer, phenomenal coach. And um, he's given us a lot of really fun memories. But, man, last year was painfully boring. You just can't have quarterbacks anymore that can't extend plays with their feet. Don't recruit them. Stop it. Just stop it. And I hope that Spencer can play better this year or if it's Labus or if it's, you know, the kid from Colorado, number eight. Why can't I remember his name? Like, it's just an old moment. You guys probably know it more than me. But anyway, doesn't to me, it's almost like it won't matter. Because this is just what the Iowa offense is, with the rare exception where there's a, a, a C.J. Beathard. Ricky Stanzi didn't really move his feet a lot, but he was a gamer. Drew Tate moved his feet a lot. If you were to ask me of the 21, 22 years that I've been covering Iowa, quote-unquote, professionally, um, who, who, do, who I would want to replicate every year as Iowa's quarterback, it's Drew Tate. Um, just he could extend plays with his feet. He was a gamer. Brad Banks could do the same thing. I was going to say, Brad, Brad, Brad Banks is the first one that comes to mind for me. Brad, Brad ben, and I, I, when I do this, people think I'm hating on Banks. It's not. I love Brad. Brad played behind the best offensive line in school history and one of the best college offensive lines of the last 50 years. He threw to more wide open receivers than any Iowa quarterback I have ever seen because mm-hmm. if you didn't sell out to stop the run with Fred Russell, and that line, you were dead. You were going to lose by four touchdowns. And the number of times that C.J. Jones and Dallas Clark uh, and Mo Brown were just wide open because teams had to dive eight into the box, no Iowa quarterback in my life has ever thrown to that many open receivers. Brad was still really good. He's still really accurate, and he had that running ability. But I think that, you know, Drew Tate um, – yeah, I hate I, – it's, it's like making me say one of my kids that I like more than the other. <laughs> but, um, but, um, but, yeah, Tate's my guy. Um, Spencer Petrus is, I think, uh, an incredible quality human um, with a strong desire to lead. And I think Spencer will be in leadership positions in his life and do really, really well. Um I, George Brett one time said that sometimes you, when you're struggling at the plate, you have to try a little easier. <laughs> and, I, and I think that Spencer, Spencer just, it's like the old record players where, you know, it, it's a 78 playing on the LP speed and it's just, or, or it's the vice versa. And it's like chipmunks. Um, Spencer just, it's not, it's not mentally slowing down for him. And I don't think it's going to. So, yeah, it was hard offensively to watch last year. Yes, Iowa won 10 games. And I realize I'm a Delta Bravo for saying things like this. <laughs> but it's just <laughs> – I want some style points, man, I guess. I, maybe that's it. Maybe, there, I'm, I, maybe I'm just spoiled. There's nothing, uh, there, there's nothing wrong with that. I, so that leads to my next question, and I, I swear it's not a troll question. I'm not trolling. So, I'm not trolling. I could have made an Iowa State baseball joke a few minutes ago. Could have. It. <laughs> because it's the new me. It was a fastball right down the plate. You totally could have it. Tim put it on the platter. I, I grinned and I, I kept my mouth shut. I did. I did. 
baseball went away when I was in college, and mm. so it still it still hurts me. Yeah, it does. All right, Brian Ferentz taking away. over the Brian Ferentz taking over the QB job, the the QB quarterbacks coach. Is it good or bad? You know, at first I think I was like, oh, this is they should have gone out and got someone that that that's played the position. And you know, Brian had the quote from a few years ago that he said he didn't know anything about quarterbacking. Brian Ferentz is a football savant. Um, and these guys that are assistant coaches are pretty much all football savants. If I can sit on my couch and break down the footwork problems of quarterbacks at most levels, which I can, which I can watch a quarterback drop back to pass. And I can tell you by watching his feet and his delivery, I could pretty much in my mind, that's, I, I know like that's, a, that's going to be a catch that unless the defensive back makes a great, I, you can see it. You watch enough. You can see it. You know, the back leg is everything. You know, the release point, you see the speed, you see that, that little hop. You can see, I'm just some 51 year old, never played college football guy sitting on the couch. Brian Ferentz can figure it out. I think that it's good that the Iowa's offensive coordinator is also the guy that spends all that time with the quarterbacks because it creates more um, synchronicity between the two. It allows the offensive coordinator to spend more time with the quarterback, which is a really good thing because the coaches are limited on how much time they can spend with it. I just feel that the biggest hurdle and obstacle to overcome is Kirk and how Kirk views offense. I don't think for a second that this offense is what Brian would do. I'm not saying it would be a hundred percent different. I think it would look a lot more like the Patriots. I think it would be a lot more like what Iowa did against Ohio state, uh, 2017 ish or so somewhere in there. Um, when they scored 55 points, I'm not saying they would have an offense that consistently could put 55 points up against an Ohio state, but I think it would be an offense that would, you know, this is a school that that, that, you know, poops, tight ends, all Americans. Okay. You know, you're going to replicate that. Then do it. Listen, Iowa, Iowa recruits around what they can replicate, replicate consistently. They can replicate good line play. You're in, you're out on both sides. Their defense is set up to where you're not going to have too many superstars because it's a lot of two gap. It's a lot of gap assignments, complimentary football. You go do your job. So the linebacker can get a guy in the hole defensive linemen don't rack up a lot of TFLs because that's not what they're supposed to do. And offensively, they know that they can consistently recruit and and build and develop offensive linemen because that's what the state of Iowa produces a lot of, just hosses. So their offense isn't ever probably and shouldn't be some super dynamic thing, but it doesn't have to be some type of, you know, trail of tears. And it just is <laughs> Kirk just makes it. I don't know, man, again, this could be a me problem. You guys watch. You guys watch it. You you, uh -huh. you can you can probably speak to this more objectively than I can. I mean, what do you think of Iowa's off? Well, I guess Iowa's beat Iowa State what now five or six years in a row, um, and a couple of those years, I think Iowa State probably had the better football team. Well, mm -hmm. what do you think of when you think of Iowa football? I, mean, I, I would I'm, go ahead, go ahead Chris. Uh, okay, so what I would say is, yeah, I tend to agree that uh, it's pretty boring to watch mm -hmm. um it, it in some ways it reminds me a lot of the of the bill snyder era at kansas state which makes sense just from you know the the coaching tree um but where it was not anything super flashy not full of superstars um but it gets the job done and for me to sit here as a Cyclone fan and say, yeah, it's really boring to watch. You know, I, like I've been thinking since you started, since you brought this up a, a couple of minutes ago and you've been talking like, I, like, w you know, one of the things that, that has been so exciting for Chris and I as, as Cyclone fans during this kind of this revival, I guess, of, of Iowa State football is, uh, you know, they're going to maybe they're not going to win as many games as they should. And they're going to give some games away, but boy, they've been really kind of exciting and fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And, and would I love to have 10 wins? Obviously I'm, I'm very jealous of that, but man, 
<laughs> I mean, I, I live up here in Minnesota and I watch some gopher games and some of those have been, been really difficult um, to, to just watch because, you know, when you see quarterbacks struggling to, to move the ball downfield, when you see, um, you know, slow, methodical, deliberate offenses, uh, half of what I'm watching, especially if I'm going to watch a team that I'm not rooting for or against is I just want to watch an exciting game. Right. I, right. I I'm kind of with you and I, and I, again, it, it's hard for me to, to criticize a 10 win team when I, you know, we've not ever seen a 10 win team in Ames. So, mm-hmm. but you guys didn't win 10 the year. Oh, COVID. Sorry. Yeah. COVID. Yeah. But oh, that was a 10 win team, but just, yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't – I for me, watching a game, if I feel like we don't – if we get behind and now I don't even have a chance, that's what's frustrating. And I think that's what Iowa fans um, see a lot. If they get behind and they and they're, they're, they need to be in a shootout, they don't feel like they have a chance because of that offense. Yeah, they're not wired that way. They're yeah, not a come-from-behind team. And that's – that's hard to watch. Iowa State, I can feel like, even though we might be down two or three touchdowns, I always feel like there's still that chance we can catch some fire here and, and get some points and make a game of it, and now we've got a shot. Um, more ways than not, we don't end up that way. Right. Uh, but hope's a dangerous thing, right? That that yeah. famous line from, from Shawshank Redemption, hope's a, a dangerous thing. Uh, I think I would much rather have hope then be in a position where if our defense doesn't step up, uh, our offense is not going to produce a lot of wins. Yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, my opinions on this, again, they're mine. And I, I probably sound like a jag off. I mean, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm complaining about a 10 win team when you just said something like Iowa state's never had a 10 win team. So I am not like, you know, inception multiple level trolling here it's just last year (laughs) last year's offense was brutal okay some years where i was 10 and 2 and their offense is you know 70th or 75th or 80th in the country okay cool 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 but don't be the 127th i just because to me you know what it is to me it's a wasted opportunity when you've got national championship caliber defense literally year in and year out the last five, six years. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a wasted opportunity. It's why I hate Wisconsin because Wisconsin, whenever, you know, through the years when they've had an opportunity to advance their brand nationally, they seize it. When Iowa has had that opportunity far more often than not, they haven't. That's why the Penn state game, I was so giddy that they won that game because all the eyes of the country were on them and then they won, but then, you know, they, they lose to Purdue. Um, and I had somebody ask me the other week, John, would you rather Iowa's basketball team play plotting and ugly and slow and boring and deliberate like Wisconsin's does, but yet you have the success with championships, Big Ten championships, that's Wisconsin's had, or have what Iowa is, which is up-tempo basketball, um, I think by and large entertaining, but you know, they won the big 10 tournament. They haven't won a regular season championship since 1979. And I'm serious. I'd rather have what Iowa has right now. I'd rather have the excitement. I feel up-tempo basketball for Iowa is a birthright of mine. It's what I grew up watching. It's, it's, it's just exciting to me and poke my eyes out with Wisconsin. So now on the other side of the table is Iowa's football team. You know, they, they win some division championships. They win, they win 10 games quite often. They play in meaningful bowl games. They've done. So now I'm basically taking the other side of that. I don't know. I, 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 it's, it's hypocritical. I don't get it. Maybe I'm just getting old and I don't know. I know. I think I'm glad that you mentioned basketball. Cause that was something that I was thinking of too. Right. Cause I remember uh, going to because I I grew up in in Wilton, not that far from West Branch. I I um the Wilton Beavers. I am a Wilton Beaver. <laughs> yeah. Um. I so I I spent more time as a kid, even though I was the the son of of Cyclones, just because my friends, you know, when I would go to basketball games with my friends, it was usually 
um, at Carver Hawkeye. And so I remember watching some of those games. And at the time, you know, Johnny or era basketball was really fast paced. And an Iowa, Indiana game uh, would be like a 55 to 50 final score. And I remember thinking, this is boring basketball. Get me in 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 Hilton. Um, and then I go to Iowa State's team this year when they couldn't hit the broad side of a barn for all of the game. I knew they were still in it because of defense. Yeah. And I never, I never realized how much I was, you know, you always hear the platitudes defense win championships and you don't like the guy who's only going to try to score and not get back, you know, not hustle back on, on defense. It um, doesn't hurt to have somebody hit a few three pointers though. It does They're not hurt to have right. anyone hit a few three pointers and it would be, it would be nice to be able to put both of those things together. And I think right. the, the best games for Iowa state this year, even when they, even when they lost, you know, I, there was a loss to Kansas this year, but they were actually in that game and they were shooting well and they were playing defense well, and it wasn't all just kind of one-sided. Um, but boy, some of those things were pretty low scoring affairs that they would win and the defense was kind of fun to watch. And I found myself kind of eating my words of, of what I grew up thinking was boring basketball was maybe a little bit more exciting let's, to me. And I don't know. I don't know what that means. Well, I think it means let's let's wait and see if this is the trend for the next several years, which I doubt it will be. Um, but really anything that approaches um, NCAA tournament bid after a two win season, you're going to love whatever it is. Oh yeah. Well, no, that's, that is, that is, give me, give me more of that because that sucked. I'll take yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I said that, uh, that uh, making the tournament was great. Everything else after that was gravy. And then after their first game, I was like, gravy is delicious. And I want more gravy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I watched, I watched um, until the national championship game. I watched 10 minutes of the NCAA tournament after Iowa got beat in the round mm-hmm. one. I was so freaking pissed and so it wasn't pissed it was just more disappointed because i started to i felt that that team uh, actually had the best march makeup of any of fran's teams with the the backcourt depth that they'd been showing for 13 straight games and with keegan who is the best style basketball player of my lifetime and then um and then that happened um that's a broad statement that's, that, yeah, and I think about some of the absolute talent that is that is gone. Keegan's the best. Ke- Keegan's the best. Um, and I, I I I fully will toss out you know the the perils of recency bias, mm-hmm. but we have metrics today, the advanced statistical metrics that we can look at relative to efficiency. Um, what Keegan did from an all around standpoint there's been no player in my lifetime or my cognizant Iowa basketball memory, which goes back to 1980, that was better than Keegan Murray. And then throwing those measurables out, there's no analog for him in my lifetime of watching Iowa basketball. Six, nine point forward, Scotty Pippenish. Um, you know, I love Roy Marble. Um, you I literally was, just had a national player of the year. Luca, yeah. Gar- Luca Garza is <laughs> Luca Garza is the most, the best offensive threat scoring, the best offensive scoring center in the history of Big Ten basketball. Mm-hmm. Keegan Murray is the best Iowa basketball player I've ever seen. Wow, that is that. I, I'm not saying you're wrong. That's just a bold well, in, statement. In, in two in in two months, the NBA is going to tell you that I'm right. All right, I, I'm I'm fully prepared for that. Um, I, I, you know, I wouldn't call um, Tyrese Hunter the best Iowa State basketball player of the last 15 years, and yet in the NBA, he's proven me wrong on that. Um, well, you guys have a lot more to choose from. Yeah, that, that is. Fair. Yeah, it's one of the few things we get to hang our hats on. So, right. it, so again, this is not a trolling question, but what do you think Fran's problem is in the tournament? Why why has guards. he had guards? Well, Guards? Yeah, it's guards. Um, this team had more, but um, the NCAA tournament is all about guards. It's about guards that can create off the dribble, get to the rim, draw attention, and then either score, mm-hmm. have that ability to score at the rim, which you need to be really athletic to be able to do in that level, 
um, or then just dish off dimes to guys that are open because now you've drawn double attention. Iowa prior to this year has had a handful of players over 15, 20 years that have been able to do that. Um, Devin Marble could do it. Um, Mike Gazelle could drive. He could get past that first guy, but he, his, his scoring percentage at the rim was not good. Um, you know, Joe Toussaint could get past anybody. He just couldn't control himself once he got past them. Um, Tony Perkins is, was the reason why I thought this team could do it because Tony over the last 10 games really did a lot of primary ball handling and half court sets. And he was athletic enough to get past that first guy and he was nails. So, the, you know, and, and then, uh, Ulyss, um, he, he can get past guys, but his, uh, he would get past guys and then he would, he wasn't a threat to score, but I just felt that Keegan's ability to drive, to take people to the rack off the dribble, mm-hmm. um, Chris's ability to do that. Patrick, to a lesser extent, Patrick has so much funk in his game. I I don't really know what his ceiling is. Maybe he's a lot closer to it than people want to believe Mm -hmm. his in half court. He gets lost. He gets caught up in the air so much and it drives me crazy. Um, But he's talented. I thought this team had enough to get to the sweet 16 and they came up against a team that had a really, really good guard from Kansas city. Uh, They came up against a team that had five or six super seniors on it. And um, five thousand point scores, and that guard was one of the best guards they'd played all year. It's a guards game in the tournament, and that's why Iowa will continue to struggle until they can have multiple guards that are as athletic as Tony Perkins can get to the rim and finish and do other things. And they are just outgunned. Franz Siena teams had more consistent guard play than Fran's Iowa teams. And that doesn't mean Fran has not tried to go get them. Sure. He just got, he just got a kid, you know, there'll be a freshman coming in this year from a prep Academy back East. That was probably it's his best point guard uh, recruit. And that's good. Um, you know, the Dick's kid, hopefully from council bluffs, he can come back and be as athletic as he was. He's a good shooter, but um, that's that, that is the white whale for Fran is, is a, you know, two or three, really athletic perimeter guys. It wasn't that Wieskamp wasn't athletic. Joe was really athletic. He just, it's just not, it's just not the level of guard play that Iowa State's had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's something I, even when you say Iowa State, really, if you look particularly over the last five years, uh, there have been way more Cinderella's that have done way more, you know, there's always the Cinderella's in the first round, maybe the second round, but, but you, you saw, the past couple of years have had some of the the, you know, the lowest seed averages right. for for a Sweet Sixteen or an Elite Eight or whatever, and you're seeing a lot of these these small schools, um, and a lot of that does because you know they're undersized teams, but they're playing a completely different style of 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 basketball, and I, you know, I hadn't really thought about it, but you're right, it's it's a lot of guard heavy play and a lot of uh, uh, creators, right? It's not. It's not kind of that traditional yeah, style. And, of- and and the transfer portal era is only going to make this more common, where you're going to get guys that had recruitable to Big Twelve, Big Ten, ACC talent for whatever reason they didn't mess with their team. Maybe they, you know, maybe they were third in line, and everybody thinks they're the guy, and they transfer to a Tennessee Chattanooga, or they transfer to a Murray State or that just because they know they can get there instantly and immediately in play. And those teams are going to benefit from it. So this um, Cinderella, the Cinderella phenomenon is only going to become more, um, more common. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you call, what do you call Cinderella when she's a dime a dozen? <laughs> <laughs> My ex-wife. Hmm. Wow. I'm going to, I'm going to leave that one alone. Um, Chris, did we get any more questions from any listeners? Uh, we didn't. No, we, we've kind of hit some of the gamut. There were some questions about early on what he had done, so we, we kind of touched on that. So, um, John, I'll, I'll probably finish with this question, and then, and then you know, we, can, we can let you have the rest of your night. I, I really appreciate you coming on. I, I, I know that you um, have made some changes and, and, and transformed a little bit your, your, your feelings and, and, and how you view things what do you think the biggest difference between 2015 John Miller is in 2022? 
Um, in 2015 specifically, my family um, began a foster care journey for the first time. And then in 2016, so we fostered two girls, one in 2015, one in 2016. Prior to 2015, my worldview, um, my political worldview, my, you know, I was like, anybody in this country can do anything that they set their mind to do if they just try hard and work hard and you too can achieve the American dream. And then we fostered. And both those girls were um, girls of color. And they both had drug addicted mothers and fathers. Both mothers were prostitutes. Both fathers were uh, felons. Those girls were at harm, in, at the risk of harm every day for sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. They lived in the areas of town where those things were most prevalent because that is how this world works. The schools they would have attended are in the worst parts of town and the American school system is set up based on the tax base of your local community will dictate the level of education that you get. And the cyclical nature of foster care and the cyclical nature of children that come from poverty in homes like that for them to repeat the circle is incredibly high. And it made me realize for the first time that that dream that I was brought up under and read, you know, bought the t-shirt, lived the poster is not a dream for everyone. And I'm sure that there's people here in this right now that it's triggering them. But um, I've been to those areas. I've been to those parts of town. I've seen those girls. I saw those girls begin to blossom in our house because they didn't fear of getting raped in their bed at night. They didn't fear that uh, somebody was going to snatch them abduct them as their biological fathers had tried to do. Um, they began to be the beautiful girls they were created to be. And it changed me. It changed our family forever. That doesn't mean that people can't work hard, try hard and achieve and attain and earn. Doesn't mean that. It just means that maybe you pause and you think about that other person that you see that's now a grown-up woman, grown-up man. You don't know where they came from. You don't know the glass ceilings they were born into, the limitations that they had to rise up and overcome, and maybe they didn't. What you see someone reaching for a handout or in a welfare line, you see maybe as someone trying to manipulate the system just to get something. You didn't see what they grew up in. You have no idea. That doesn't make the journey that you took that may not have been easy as well, any less valid and props to you. But try to have some compassion for the likely story that everyone has of what they had to deal with and overcome too. That's the biggest difference in me is that I am more open-minded. I am more accepting. I am less judgmental and I am passionate about this particular topic. And that will be the trajectory of any broadcasting I do post energy company retirement for reasons. Um, that will be it. It will be about sharing stories like that. It will be about amplifying justice. It will be about amplifying voices of those people who are on the margins that society says aren't worthy, sharing those stories and trying to illuminate to people like me, even though I grew up in small town, Iowa, that my parents couldn't afford to buy me Air Jordans, that I got ridiculed for the Walmart version. They were called winner's choice. We didn't have much money either. It doesn't mean that I didn't have some hurdles to overcome as well. It just didn't mean I, it just means I didn't have inherent things, obstacles, glass ceilings to also overcome. There are so many people in this country that have the also overcome obstacles in their way. I just wish more people would be open-minded to considering that and having compassion 
that's the biggest difference in me in 2022 versus 2015. Some people want to say, oh, John's gone lib. I just like to say John's gone love. And um, I need to do a better job of delivering this message which, with a more gentle tone, but I get worked up about it. And the next four or five years before I, you know, retire from the energy industry and just go do the podcast that I've always wanted to do, or not that I've always wanted to do that I want to do now, I'll be working on softening the edges so that maybe my message that I want to get out there is better received with less um, agitation and triggering. I've got a lot of work to do on that. I freely admit it, but that's the biggest difference in me now versus seven years ago. Well, I, I don't, I don't know what else to say, but, but thank you. This has been um, for me, one of the, one of the best experiences that we've had on here. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. And um I can't wait for four or five years for you to retire so that we can listen to that. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, um, I think the world is missing a lot of, of compassion and love and understanding of other people's struggles. And uh, we used to, as a country, see those things. And we're pretty blinded right now. Uh, and I, I, I said something to somebody on Twitter the other day that, um, they were going to leave and get off Twitter because it was so toxic and so on. And uh, I, I said, you know, if all the good people leave, what's that leave? Um, and he ended up sticking around. And then uh, he, uh, I retweeted Chris uh, Williams' uh, fundraiser that he was doing for St. Uh, Baldrick's. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman turned around and saw my tweet and donated and got his company to match his donation. And he sent me a direct message and he said, you know, if I'd have left the other day, like I wanted to, I wouldn't have saw that. And I'm glad I didn't leave. And I said, well, I'm glad you didn't leave either. And that's just a small, I mean, Twitter's, Twitter's not real world, right? I get that. But that lesson of if the good people just stop trying because it's so overwhelming, we don't have a chance, but yeah. With people like you, uh, and and what you've talked about tonight, uh, it makes me feel better about what 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 is possible. Boy, well, I, I I don't really know what that what that means because I recently announced I was taking a break from Twitter, and you uh -huh. did not you did not take a second to tell me to stick around. <laughs> That's because fifty percent of your tweets yeah. are making fun of me. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, 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 I appreciate those sentiments. I, I've got a, I've got a lot of maturing to do. Um, I realize that, but you know, there's a slogan from, uh, this is not about who said it. It's about what it is. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Mm hmm and who, who cares if someone on the left or someone on the right said it or it was on a poster? Who cares? Be the change that you want to see in the world. If it can't start with you, then where does it start? And you don't have to switch party affiliations. You don't have to begin to take up mantras that will make certain people in your family not like you. Um, but if you want to live in a better world, a more loving world, then start right now in your house. Stop, stop, just, you know, stop this thinking of, you know, four legs, good, two legs, bad, or Wellian style garbage. That's been a part of political playbooks for the last two centuries on this planet. Stop it. Unplug from it. Turn off CNN, turn off Fox news, turn off the poison machines what do you want to leave as a legacy in this world? Let's bring it back to where we started. We will all, every single one of us, whether we choose to or not, there is no getting off this ride. Each and every single one of us will leave behind a legacy. When we all pass, when, when Jim Zawel passed, there was a big outpouring of emotion and stories things like that. A week later, that stuff was done. When I pass, there'll be some people that say some words about me for a week and outside of my family, that'll be done. But the things that can last is the love that we leave behind. And I know this is sounding a little hippy dippy. I'm a huge Beatles fan. And um, 
the love we take is equal to the love we make. I, 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 my daughter, Grace and I are huge science fiction fans, huge. Um, like we've, we've verbalized into our phone, a number of books. I'm also going to do that as, you know, I'm going to write and I'm going to podcast in my retirement. And I believe that time travel already exists. And one thing can travel through time and that's love. You think of when you throw a rock into a pond, might only weigh two ounces, Iowa farm pond, you throw a two ounce rock into a pond, that ripple is going to reach the other side of the pond. I think love is the same way. The love that we can pour into the world will outlive us. It is a ripple moving forward in time. Those girls that we had in our house and the Millers are nothing special. We just decided to actually do something that millions of people do. The love that we poured into those two girls who've now been adopted into safe, functional, healthy families, the trajectory of their lives have been changed. Their children, their grandchildren, their grandchildren, that love is going to carry forward through time. That's the legacy I want to leave. That's the legacy each and every single one of us can leave. You don't have to foster. Maybe just love. Maybe don't type that hateful thing on Facebook. Maybe back away from Twitter, John. I'm talking to you. <laughs> Maybe just be nice. Be kind today. Choose not to be an a-hole. And again, talking to myself, that's the growth that I have. Otherwise, this podcast thing I want to do in five years won't work. It will fall on deaf ears because I'm the angry man shouting. And um, just love, man. Just love. Perfect. Uh, yeah, boy, very well said. I don't want to ruin this with saying too many other things. So, Chris, unless you have anything else, I think we should go ahead and get this thing wrapped up. Well, I think we I, I don't know how we could say anything else. Perfect. Well, John, once again, we cannot thank you enough for coming on here for your transparency and your uh, willingness to to share uh, willingness to to inspire uh, I'm just feeling very humbled right now. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for that. This has been Old Man Strength, the podcast of the Tailgate Society. Please check us out on the web at thetailgatesociety.com, at Tailgate Society on Twitter. You can find Chris and I, strength underscore old on Twitter. He is side grad, side dad. I am kind of on a pseudo hiatus, but I am Tim Johnson, MN. Uh, John, do you want to throw out any other plugs here while we're doing plugs? Um, just at Hawkeye podcast. We'll keep it around for a bit. Perfect. Um, and please go ahead. Once again, please check out our sponsor, Revelton Distillery at 1400 West Clay Street in Osceola, Iowa. A lot of great products there. If you have not listened to Chris and I doing our live stream from there or our pseudo live, our live recording, uh, please go ahead and give that a listen and and give them uh, a try. Give them a visit. A fantastic place. A good time to hang out. Um, and with that, guys, I think I think we're good. We will see you guys next time. I don't want to get on the bandwagon. I'll burn that wagon down and join the band. Traveling troubadours terrorizing street corners just to try to get some supper in our hands. Now I waited all my life to get this off my chest screen, buddy murder until someone understands that it ain't about the money, the drugs, or the women. I make this noise just because I can. And we'll all join in to that original scene.